Thank you to everyone for joining us today. We are delighted to welcome you to the first session of the UN Global Compact Academy, a new learning experience from the UN Global Compact. We are launching the UN Global Compact Academy to help you accelerate your sustainability performance. Anchored in our principles-based approach, the Academy is both accessible and solution-oriented. Our learning portfolio will cover three themes across a range of corporate sustainability challenges and opportunities, with a special focus on the UN Global Goals. Through the Academy, you have the opportunity to connect and learn directly from world-class experts from the UN, business and academia. Academy tools and resources will help you translate what you learn into real action. The UN Global Compact Academy is here to coach you to build actionable skills and responsibly accelerate your company's positive impacts, both now and far into the future. We look forward to working with all of you. Now it is time to tune in to today's session to learn from John Ruggie and Lise Kingo on how to take a principle-based approach to the global goals, an approach that puts respect for human rights at the center of business action. Tell everyone a little bit about yourself, but then also uh, concretely uh, help us understand really what we're talking about when we talk about the sustainable develop, development goals and John, uh, your work uh, at the UN on uh, uh, business and human rights. Uh, so Lisa, if you'd like to get started, how do we begin to enter this huge topic? Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm Lisa Kinko, and uh, I have spent uh, the first 25 years of my working life with business uh, and been with the UN Global Compact for close to three years. It has been an absolutely amazing time because uh, I had the pleasure of arriving more or less at the same time as the uh, global goals and the agenda 2030 was passed at the UN. So we have been dealing with um, how to build the global goals on the 10 principles that the UN Global Compact is founded on. And I really look forward to getting into some further details and practical examples today of how we do that. And it's just amazing to have John with us, who is the expert and the founding father of everything we have to talk about today. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, I'm John Ruggie. Um, so my, my deep concern with, uh, with uh, the state of the world actually goes back a number of years. Um, we are... Um, suffering today from um, some of the excesses of globalization and the uh, sustainable development goals or the global goals um, as they're also known um, provide um, a guidance for um, how we can move forward uh, to a more sustainable world both socially um, and environmentally um, the problem was recognized a long time ago um, in January 1999, when Kofi Annan, who was then Secretary General, first um, announced the Global Compact, um, he had this to say, and if you don't mind, I brought this oh, with me. I brought it too. Okay. <laughs> um, so he, uh, he essentially said um, at the World Economic Forum that unless globalization has stronger social pillars, uh, it is vulnerable. Um, and here's the quote, it is vulnerable to backlash from all the isms of our post-Cold War world. Protectionism, populism, nationalism, ethnic chauvinism, fanaticism, and terrorism. And he added, if we cannot make globalization work for all, in the end it will work for none. And I think we see, very much we see signs of all of those isms that he predicted in 1999. Now, uh, uh, 19 years later, here we are trying to grapple with the issues that he outlined um, and the SDGs, the, the global goals, uh, the global compact and the UN guiding principles uh, on business and human rights uh, are a, a, a set of guidelines of how to get out of this mess uh, that we now find ourselves in. 
Now, to me, like the, the uh, sort of mind-boggling thing about the, the global goals is like if you think about it kind of anthropologically, it's like you know people form communities and the communities form rules, uh, and then we you know form cities and the cities have laws and nations have laws. I mean, this is truly, uh, I think, the first totally global effort to codify how we're to live uh, just as a species, I guess. Um, and so under that, uh, it, so there's a lot of gravitas here, right? Um, but so what are they exactly? I mean, uh, people who are, who are watching may be familiar. Well, there's 17 sustainable development goals and 169 um, uh, smaller uh, targets that, uh, that we're all supposed to reach. And it would be difficult to name them, let alone, you know, say how to implement them. But get us started here uh, and, and uh, you know, characterize for us what, um, what they are. Uh, you know, in, a, in the most practical way you can think of. And then, John, if you want to jump in and talk about uh, the UN uh, principles that you that you developed um, and how those um, how those intersect with this with the global goals, Lisa. Um, yeah. Well, I think first of all, just being very clear about the roots of the UN Global Compact. Yeah. I really loved. Kofi Annan's uh, quote that John was just sharing. And I also want to add that when the Global Compact was created, it was done by Kofi Annan with a view to finding a way to give globalization a human face in a compact between UN and business. Mm -hmm. So that's important. And now when we have the new global goals, they are actually an amazing lighthouse they are an amazing vision of how such a much better world would look. So they are in a way a description of the world that we all want. The goals are very interconnected. So they are both going to provide us with a peaceful world, with a world with social uh, equality, and with a world where the planet is much more in harmony than the case is today. And it's the first time in the history of human mankind where we had an agreed set of targets. Mm -hmm. I think we should recall that at the UN two and a half year ago, mm -hmm. all member states unanimously agreed that the 2030 agenda, the 17 global goals, that is the plan for the world. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a plan B. So we really have to make this plan work. We have less than 4,500 days. But the important thing is not to forget that making these goals have to build on the 10 principles and in particular on the human rights principles. So the importance, I think, of the, of the, of the goals is to provide uh, a, a, a quantitative target that people can keep in mind but underlying each of these goals is a set of principles. Uh, principles are guides to um, appropriate or good behavior, right? Fairness is a principle. Uh, due process is a principle. Mm -hmm. um, and each of these 17 goals draws on underlying principles, um, many of which have to do with human rights, some of which have to do with the climate uh, and other environmental factors, which in turn have human rights implications. We know that if the climate goes really bad, it's, it's poor people who are going to suffer most. It's poor people in low-lying countries in the developing world that will suffer most. So aside from the numerical targets, which people tend to latch onto, uh, there are underlying principles which it's important to understand if, if, if you are to really um, uh, aspire to and align your, your business practices with the uh, uh, global goals. When we read about uh, uh, the goals, the 10 principles, the, uh, the business and human rights standards, uh, they're often just kind of received, right? Mm -hmm. we, we read about them, we hear about them, but like it's such a uh, remarkable thing to have you here. Like what was it, how did you develop them? I mean, it, it, was, was, it was a six year project as I understand it. Uh, you know, these, 
these, uh, particularly the UN Business and Human Rights Goals, did not exist. And when you were done, they existed. So, like, what was that process like? How do you, how do you, when you're constructing goals like this, you're cons you're you're talking to people, you're you're conducting research. How do you know you're picking the right ones and putting them in the right order? And you're not using any words that are going to make people angry. <laughs> Which is always a risk in the UN. Right. Um, no, in, in terms of the um, uh, guiding principles on business and human rights, it was a six-year process uh, with a fifth, some, something like 50 uh, international consultations on every continent, uh, site visits to any number of companies, um, consultations with individual governments, uh, with business groups, with groups of lawyers, with NGOs, with labor unions, and on and on and on. Uh, and by the end, um, it sort of it crystallized that, wait, this, this whole area of business and human rights can be, can be sort of boiled down to three fundamental thoughts. One, that states have a duty to protect against human rights abuses, not only human rights abuses that state agents commit, but that third parties commit, and business is a third party. So the state has a duty to protect against business-related human rights um, harm. Secondly, business has an independent responsibility to respect human rights, to respect the rights of workers and, 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 and communities and, and so forth. And thirdly, that um, those who are adversely affected have a right to remedy. Uh, and the 31 principles simply allow, and, and commentary simply elaborate what those three foundational ideas mean. Mm -hmm. um, so so we're, we're here today uh, specifically to, to help the viewers uh, really get up to speed on how to implement all of these uh, sort of, you know, codified ideas. Um, and since, as you said, we're, we're a couple years in to the existence of these things. So, uh, you know, what, where are we relative to when you joined UN Global Compact? Like, what's the state of the goals? Like, when you look at the business community right now, what do you see? Are there leaders? Are there more leaders than you thought? Are there fewer leaders than you thought? And what are they doing? Mm -hmm. Well, let me start by saying, where are we on the global goals mm -hmm. two years into their 50-year span? Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we did an interesting stock-taking exercise last summer mm -hmm. where it quickly becomes very clear that there are particularly two areas on all the 17 goals where we are lacking seriously behind. One area is on climate change. The other area is on inequalities. And just to give you a few examples, I mean, in terms of, um, in terms of gender parity, the gender situation, we were just celebrating International Women's Day um, last week. Um, we are still looking at maybe 270 years more before we will have gender parity. So things are moving more backwards than forwards now, at I, the moment. Earlier you said that we have 4,500 <laughs> days uh, before we, yeah. we hit the 2,300. Now, uh, I'm not a, I wasn't a math major, but it seems like 270 <laughs> years is longer than 4,500 yes, days. Yes, certainly. So we are not in a good situation when it comes to gender inequality, which from a business perspective, is not very productive because right. there's actually a 28 trillion upside if we could activate women across the society in the same way as we are activating men. We have many, many young people that really should be given this chance. And we have way too many people that are still living, that still lives on an average uh, daily uh, amount less than uh, $2. And I think the shocking thing is that one third of these people actually have a job. So in terms of decent work in the supply chain, I think there's a huge challenge also for many companies mm -hmm. to really look into their supply chain and make sure that decent work is uh, a common theme across all their suppliers. What's the main route you think that 
the economy is taking to address these things? I mean, is it governments writing rules and laws that are, uh, you know, that are being taken up by private sector companies who fall into the jurisdictions? Is it large companies that, as you just said, are scrutinizing their supply chains and making demands of their suppliers? Or is it a more distributed bottom up approach of individual executives, many, many, you know, hundreds of who are with us here today? Yeah. yeah. Uh, like, what is the dominant approach? Um, and, well, let's, 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 yeah. let's stop there first. Well, um, it's very interesting. Um, we recently issued uh, the annual progress report mm -hmm. of the UN Global Compact, where we looked at both how all our companies are faring on the 10 principles, but also after two years on the goals. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, I, I, I think there are some really positive news in, in there. One piece is that 75% uh, of our companies are saying that they are already working with the global goals, finding ways to implement them in, in their business strategies. In these companies, close to 70%, uh, the CEOs are actively involved. And that says a lot about that the global goals has become a strategic innovation business agenda and that many companies are basing their business strategy and taking inspiration from the global goals and the principles. And that's 75% and of your companies and you have a, a, an extraordinary number of yes, companies. Yes, close to 10,000. Okay, so that 75% of 10,000 is not an insignificant number. Uh, as, as we're chatting here, I'm getting questions from viewers. Uh, one of them, uh, touching on, on your comments of a moment, a moment ago, uh, what are the most important actions businesses can take to achieve gender equality? This is a topic that in the United States has been uh, a daily headline, uh, uh, bringing you know, people, people really struggling with this issue in the United States and, yeah. and constantly elsewhere too. But what, what do you think? How, uh, what can businesses do well, I have a few very simple suggestions that I think would be excellent. First, to sign up to the Women Empowerment Principles that Compaq launched, I think, eight years ago, together with UN Women. It's seven very practical principles that I know work really well from a business perspective. And if you want to know how you are faring on gender uh, empowerment, you can do our very easy uh, gap assessment tool. It's on our website and it will give you an immediate status of how you are faring on these seven principles. Mm -hmm. And are, it gives good ideas for moving forward. What are the, uh, what are the biggest issues that, that companies confront on this topic? And glass ceiling, you know, pay disparity, these are the, yeah. the things that have been yeah. with us forever yeah. and probably the most common. Are there concrete steps that companies have been taking that you think are successful? Um, I think that companies have been working a lot on trying to ensure equal pay, mm -hmm. which is really an issue that we have been knowing for many years. I think it's still not solved, but I know that it's high on the agenda. Mm -hmm. I think another theme is how to uh, invite more women to be part of top management and boards. Um, that is a priority that we have also seen for many years. Unfortunately, it's moving a little bit backwards these days. So I think it's really, really important to keep that going because having diversity in discussions and decisions in top management and on boards is crucially important, particularly as we know that many boards are, are discussing the global goals and the wider societal challenges. And to solve these difficult themes, you really need women, you need diversity around the table. John, any, any thoughts on that from your work with the UN? There's, there must be... Uh, 
disparities among nations, among regions, in, in how companies are, are addressing these topics or not? Sure. Um, the question you initially asked is whether whether this is the, the change drivers are going to be governments or business or whoever. Yeah. Uh, this is an all um, all hands on deck kind kind of issue. Um, governments are becoming more active um, in the area of human rights um, and 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 particularly by adopting uh, non financial disclosure requirements due diligence requirements for both environmental issues and for human rights issues, uh, that will, will have two positive effects, or has already two positive effects. Being required to disclose that you have no slave labor um, in your supply chain means that you actually have to dig into your own supply chain to see what's there. Uh, and that creates internal communication and internal discussion um, whereby people inside the company become aware of issues they might not have become aware of. Secondly, when that, when that information is disclosed, um, outside um, actors, whether it's civil society or authorities, can, can, or any other third party, can then begin to ask questions and, and to check up. So the movement um, on, on, on that front, I think, has positive um, consequences across the entire array of, of issues that it touches upon. If your CEO is not involved and the board does not reach the board level and you're in charge of sustainability at your company, how, what, what um, tools does uh, a sustainability chief have to, um, to drum up you know, a, a, a either excitement from the employee base mm -hmm. or uh, attention from the uh, the head managers. Well, if, if if I can jump in on that one, I and and taking um, a, a step back, um, the the uh, the approach to a company getting engaged with and supporting the goals, um, it has to have two attributes. Um, for uh, for a CEO to fully understand, or for a board to fully understand, first um, it 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 can't come in with little fragments of cherry picked things. Uh, there has to be an, an an overarching conceptual framework, uh, and that conceptual framework I think consists of of two dimensions. Um, the first is that um, whatever we do, it should be principled based, not unprincipled. And by unprincipled, I mean repackaging things that we already do and calling it a contribution to the to the goals, um, or uh, for 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 example, um, simply picking whatever low hanging fruit is out there. Um, that's unprincipled. Principled means that you are actually looking for the underlying principles that have um, tremendous um, um, multiplier uh, 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 effects. So in, in the area of, of human rights, um, a foundational principle is respect for human rights. Now, respect is a word we use every day, but respect has very, very deep meanings. Uh, to respect people, to treat people with respect, cuts across every one of these principles. So what does respect mean? What do we have the greatest impact on as a company? And what does it mean to respect people and environment in that context. So the first issue is to look at the underlying principles. The second is to recognize that the principles are very interconnected. Um, and so um, the, the second element of, of, a, of a pitch to a CEO is we need to be strategic. We need to in, invest in wherever we can have the greatest effect across the board. So you were talking about decent work before. Um, if you invest in decent work in your own workplace and in the supply chain, you affect at least six or seven, uh, if not more, sustainable development goals. Right? Um, decent work includes issues of wages, issues of forced labor, issue of uh, modern-day uh, slave labor, freedom of association, um, reduces inequalities, enhances gender equality. It just it goes on and on. Clean water good health. Um, it just goes on and on. So you, you, you have 
um, uh, an opportunity to leverage whatever it is you decide to engage in by understanding uh, first the principles underlying it uh, and the connections among them. And I think any board, a board is a strategic entity for a company, any board wants to see, okay, what's the principle here and what are the, what's the strategy? Right. Not, um, he, here, here are three things we could be doing. I, another question from the audience that addresses more uh, sort of outcomes. Uh, how, how can companies report on their progress about the, uh, toward the sustainable development goals and, and sort of share them publicly? Uh, and I would add, like, what are the sort of increasing returns of, of companies doing that? I mean, do you see evidence of, of companies saying we've done this toward the goals and uh, having that create competitive pressure among companies in an industry? Well, well, I think elaborating on what John already said, I mean, the best practice that we are seeing at the moment, that's companies that are combining their business strategy with their sustainability strategy. So they're basically doing an integrated strategy. Right that they are building on solid principles, the 10 principles, because we are all members of the UN Global Compact, and then identifying a, a set of global goals that are relating to their business, that are material to what they do, and where the company is having an impact, so that the company can follow what kind of impact will they actually have on their own financial bottom line, but also on society around them. Mm -hmm. So there are great examples in the car industry, in the financial industry, uh, in the energy industry of companies already doing this. And then it's a very natural thing also to report in an integrated way of course, on how you are running your business in a principled, responsible, sustainable way. So at the Compact at the moment, we are offering many action platforms for companies to come and join to explore these interesting interconnections mm -hmm. between the goals and the principles. And one of them is exactly about how to report right. on the SDGs and the principles. And what I find really interesting is that the financial sector is so involved and so interested in being part of this work because the financial sector is realizing more and more that they must base their evaluation of companies on the way they deal with sustainability in a principled way. So let's just get back to like a very basic question, which, uh, which is that it's, it's the role of business to stay in business. And to stay in business, and the reason we sort of got into this uh, spectrum of, of issues we have that, that required the goals, is um, in order to stay in business, businesses externalize problems uh, and costs out outside their borders into society. You know, they externalize uh, health issues. It's the uh, companies are um, historically externalizing machines. Uh, and, and the goal here is to sort of beat that back or, or, or reverse it. Um, so could you just describe that challenge of, you know, the, the goal of business is not to execute the goals. The goal of business is to stay in business. Um, and while there's vast overlap, it's not 100% overlap, is it? Well, I'd be happy to jump in on that. First, it, I think by now, with all the empirical studies that we've seen, it's a myth. Uh, it is, it's an outright myth that respecting rights, for example, is an issue of cost. Uh, it's an is it, it may be an investment in the, in the medium term, but it's not an issue of outright cost. Um, secondly, there are a number of, of companies, um, Lisa is not allowed to mention company names because she, <laughs> all, all of her children are equal, right? Yeah. <laughs> but you take a company like, like Unilever that decided some years ago when it adopted the Sustainable Living Plan, it essentially said, we're competing in a global market of 2 billion. 
all of us. Um, there are, more, there are more, more than 2 billion people out there in the world. We want to double the size of that market, but we know we can't do it with the current business model that we have. We fundamentally have to transform our business model. So investing in our suppliers uh, produces um, a better supply of, from local suppliers. It gives them an income. They become buyers of things. Um, investing in literally in going out into Indian villages to teach hand washing uh, improves health um, and makes people more productive. And it also sells more life boy soap uh, at the same time. So th th a number of companies have rethought this, this business model that says we have to keep our costs to the minimum and, and pay attention only to the short term uh, because that way you're on the short term treadmill and you continue to externalize because that's part of the cost cutting. But if, you, if, if the business model is transformed and you, and you double the size of your, of your market while holding your, in your CO2 footprint constant as Unilever has committed, mm -hmm. that's sustainable policy as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting in your question that you bring up a little bit, oh, what about companies that feel the business of business is business? Um, I think that phrase is almost dead. I hear that very, very rarely among companies. I think companies have mostly today realized that Business is part of society. And if society doesn't thrive, neither do business. Which is why when the UN did the three year consultation process to identify the theme of all the global goals, business were, was very interested and very much part of this process. And I think many companies feel that they have an ownership of the goals as they look today. Mm -hmm. And they understand why they need to cover, you know, all perspectives of the world we live in um, and why everything is interconnected and why companies need to show that they are a very active player in being part of taking responsibility for the goals, otherwise we won't be able to meet them, but also how to turn risks into possibilities and opportunities. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that uh, companies today are very alert to the fact that having a responsible pr principled business strategy will help them do many things. First, maintain their license to operate in society. Um, motivate employees, attract employees to come and work for their companies. Mm -hmm. You know, young people today are very critical, asking really good questions. Um, it's also a matter of um, reflecting what your uh, clients, what your customers want from you. And it's making sure that you are um, sort of uh, uh, channeling down or cascading down your own perspectives through your value chain because companies today are also being kept responsible for their supply chain and what requirements they are putting mm -hmm. to, to their suppliers. So I think there's a whole new what could you say, business case today? And with the financial sector coming in, I think stronger today than we have ever seen before, realizing that this is part of their business as well. Mm -hmm. And I cannot, I cannot help mentioning the annual letter of Larry Fink of the BlackRock Company, sure. who really nailed it by saying, you know, I'm aware that the business of the financial sector is not only to create a nice financial bottom lines for the companies, it is to help create a society that thrives. And that's a major statement that I think made many people really optimistic. 
Could I just follow up Please. on this um, on the investment side because I think it's so critical. It's a, it's a it's it's an emerging fundamental trend. We talked about ESG investing before. Um, ESG. You just uh, spell that out. And, uh, sorry. For, just in case. <laughs> and and um, um, investment that includes environmental, social, and corporate governance criteria. Uh, and more and more uh, investment uh, um, asset managers, investment managers, um, have developed algorithms um, that includes financial analytics with ESG criteria, so that you can you can expect a decent return, but through a portfolio that also addresses environmental, social, and governance criteria. Um, as of now, uh, ESG. Um, uh, uh, funds are the fastest growing area in the investment field. Um, as of now, there is likely to be something like a 30 to $40 trillion wealth transfer from the baby boomers to the millennials. Um, every study- Skipping Gen X. Spe like yeah, just, your, your problem. Right out of it. Yeah, <laughs> your problem. Yeah. Um, the, the, uh, the consultancies have all done studies. Mm. Who, 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 uh, who are the millennials and how are they different? Uh, one way that they are said to be different is that they take ESG factors much more seriously than, than their parents did. Um, and and uh, 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 people who are already- um, uh, with high net worth millennials um, demonstrate through their investment patterns that ESG issues matter to them as much as financial performance. To what extent are companies learning about the goals from investors? Uh, in the United States, one prominent example we see is, is the divest from fossil fuels movement, which, mm -hmm. speaking personally, it often feels like a, a political campaign. Um, but uh, asset managers are asked to divest from any number of, of things. Um, so I, I, I guess that's, that's the question is, you know, there's a lot of ways people can learn about the SDGs. And I have a, a question coming uh, from that in a second. Um, but how much of that information is coming from being, being pressed, executives being pressed by investors on these, on these topics? Well, let me answer that in a little bit a different way. I think in order for the world to really succeed on the goals, mm -hmm. we need to mobilize citizens, people like all of us <laughs> just... uh, in many different ways. And uh, we are seeing um, many um, investment banks, beginning to issue products to their clients that includes the opportunity to do, to do ESG investment as John was talking about. So when you go to see your investment banker, you might be presented with five different products and hopefully three of them are ESG products. Mm -hmm. And you will be explained why that's actually a very good idea and why this is what you might want to choose. And I think when that really begins to happen, that no matter where you go in society, you are presented with better options to do your business in a sustainable way, then we will begin to see a change. Hopefully, when you go into a shop to buy yourself a new outfit, you will be offered a sustainable piece of textiles mm -hmm. that will um, make you feel that you are also contributing as a person, as an individual, to actually achieving the goals. It's a theme I feel we all need to think much more about because, of course, we have a role in our daily jobs as professionals, but we could also make a huge difference as private individuals. Mm -hmm. Are you okay? That was the first time I've ever stabbed anyone during an interview. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> I just got a little bit of okay, color. Okay, just, just double checking. You know, so, so some asset managers <laughs> actually go a step further. They say to a potential client, give me your values and I will find you the portfolio. Mm. Makes sense. Yeah. So this is a question from, uh, from uh, Sandra in Kenya who says, we still have a majority who are not aware of the global goals, especially young people. 
how do you increase awareness uh, to ensure that everybody's participating? And it makes me wonder about something you said a second ago uh, about Unilever, which is, do you have to teach people about the sustainable development goals or can you just teach them to wash your hands? Like what's the balance between um, Unilever or I don't want to pick on Unilever, but a company going into markets and introducing behaviors, like do they have to fly the flag of, of the goals, which we have here in pillow form. <laughs> Available for $9.99. They just, they <laughs> see, $15 they just if seep you into your head while you're asleep. Uh, very good. Um, uh, you know, it, it, the goals are the goals, whether you know what the goals are, doesn't matter as long as you do the right thing, right? right? I mean, for an individual, for a company, it's different. The company has to make an internal case for why it's doing what it's doing and frame it in some, in some context that is recognized by, by the uh, leadership of the company mm -hmm. and by its external audience. I'm so happy that we get a question from Kenya because that's actually one of the places in the world where we have a great UN Global Compact local network. Um, we have more than 70 local networks across the world and they play such an important role in spreading the word about the global goals, both to all the companies in the country, but definitely also to civil society who are also members of the UN Global Compact and to citizens in many different ways. And I can assure you that when you look into uh, activities at a national level, it's really encouraging to see how so many initiatives, so many engaged people, particularly young people, mm. are picking up this ball and, you know, getting together, doing whatever they feel is interesting to create awareness around the global goals. And at the UN Global Compact, our vision is that we would like to create a movement of responsible companies, organizations, people that all want to drive the world towards the global goals. So we are very happy every time we see any organization built on principles really driving the goals. Mm -hmm. But I think again, as much as any of us can do as individuals to get these goals across is really important. And in, if you want to have a picture of who is responsible for making the goals by 2030, uh, just pick up a mirror and you will see your own face. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, uh, another question from, from viewers uh, is, is significant because we have mentioned a couple large companies and the top 500 or the top 1,000 brands that, mm -hmm. uh, that are focused on those, the 2 billion richest uh, people obscure the fact that the vast majority of the world economy is made up of small and, and medium-sized enterprises uh, who don't have uh, enormous marketing budgets and who don't have the visibility uh, that, that S&P 500 CEOs have. So what can, what can smaller, you know, the, uh, 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 you know, the, what can people who are running the bulk of the economy do from their smaller scale, I guess? Well, in some sense, the answer to that question is easy. Um, it's a matter of scale. It's as simple as that. I said before that you have to have sort of, your approach has to have two elements. It should be principle, right? Um, and um, it, it, it should view interconnections. Any, any single individual can do that. It's a matter of scale. You and I can do that in our individual lives. Mm -hmm. So an SME isn't in principle different in this respect. It's different in the kinds of systems it can put together and in the diversity of issues that it can address. But I, I, I've, I've never felt that there was this dichotomous division between large companies and SMEs. It's simply a matter of scale of what they can do. Yeah, I, I think there's so many great examples from all our local networks across the world that small and medium-sized companies are picking up this agenda 
you know, in their own pace, in their own scale. But the important thing is many small and also medium-sized companies are very innovative. They are entrepreneurial initiatives. And very often their idea built on a piece of wonderful info, uh, innovation that has come out of uh, one, of, one of the global goals. So social entrepreneurs would often want to improve the situation for people in their country and therefore put new products on the market uh, that can uh, do wonderful things that have never happened mm -hmm. before. So I actually think that many small and medium-sized companies are driving a, fa a fabulous innovation around the goals that the bigger companies can take a lot of inspiration from. Mm -hmm. And since this is also a, an innovation agenda where we cannot continue doing business as usual now with the principles right. and the goals, it's very important that the small and medium-sized companies are very much visible and part of the entire exercise. We have, uh, with just a couple of minutes left, we have a couple more questions that are, are good compliments. One of them is, how can the 10 uh, UNGCP uh, acronyms on the fly, I'm sure I messed that up, but I apologize, uh, UN Global Compact uh, principles, how can those serve as a, uh, as a portal into the, the larger UN goals? Um, and then the other one is, uh, if everybody could pick one thing to do, uh, what would that be? Keeping in mind that a lot of the conversation is about doing all of them. But uh, so A, how do the 10 uh, UN Global Compact principles act as a portal into the bigger conversation? And then if everybody did one thing, what would it be? Well, if, if, if I hit it off, I mean, I think when all companies, when they join the UN Global Compact, their CEO sends a letter to the UN Secretary General committing the company to adhere to the 10 principles and to take inspiration from the global goals. So adhering to the 10 principles, mapping where you are doing well, where you're doing not so well, that's the starting point. And the goals is the lighthouse, is the inspiration for where to go. So I see it very clearly as the principles being the compass that helps us in the daily work with managing all the issues of running a responsible business. And the goals is the lighthouse, the inspiration. So it's very simple in that sense. Excellent. <clears throat> Two quick remarks from me. One, if, if I could do only one thing, um, I would focus on decent work because every company has workers. <laughs> it's the one thing that they all have in common. Right. And, and decent work, as I said, affects a half a dozen or seven or eight uh, of, of the uh, sustainable development goals. The second thing I would say um, is that the notion of respect for human rights is, is not always well understood in the business community. In fact, one of the consultancies, uh, when the SDGs were adopted, uh, came out with this uh, continuum, it called, um, from responsibility to opportunity. So we leave responsibility behind and we grab opportunity, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Well, everybody understands in the environment that if you treat the environment with respect, if you treat the issue of climate change with respect, you have a positive impact. And it's the same thing with human rights. You treat workers and, and people in communities with respect, or, or women with respect, you have a positive impact. So it's a virtuous circle or cycle, not a continuum. Mm -hmm. And I think not enough business people have understood that fact, and that would be my concluding thought. Okay, Lisa, any concluding thoughts? Well, um, I would like to invite everybody to help us making global goals local business. It's such an important thing to keep up the momentum around the global goals. I think we have a great optimism around the goals based on the principles right now, but we need to keep that momentum up and running. 
We are close to 10,000 companies, 3,000 organizations in the Global Compact, but there are many more out there. So please, everyone, let's spread the word. Let's turn this into a global movement and let's show that we can do this by 2030 and that we don't need a plan B. Okay, well, thank you, Lisa Kinko, CEO and Executive Director of the UN Global Compact. John Ruggie, Vice Professor of Human Rights and International Affairs at Harvard Kennedy School. And I'm Eric Rostin, Sustainability Editor of Bloomberg News. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you for participating in the inaugural UN Global Compact Academy session. We hope you enjoyed it and that you learned something new from it. To help us keep developing the Academy in a way that meets your needs, we now ask you to fill out the quick survey that you received a link to. The Academy focuses on learning that ensures results, and although this session is now over, the learning opportunities do not stop here. Later this week, you will receive an email with follow-up materials. This will include a new how-to guide on how to take a principle-based approach to the global goals, the recording of this session, and recommendations for additional resources for you to use as you start applying your learning within your company. We hope you found today's session an interesting and rewarding learning experience. And the great news is that this is just the beginning. Academy sessions including practical and blended learning experiences to help you excel, will take place across key topics throughout the year. Before we end today, we encourage you to sign up for the next three Academy sessions for your chance to learn from key influencers on actions needed to advance progress on climate action, decent work and human rights. Joining the Academy couldn't be easier. Just visit our website. Thank you again to our wonderful speakers, to Accenture, and thank you all for joining. We hope you will be with us for many sessions to come.